Galatians. In the book of Galatians, the last chapter. Hello. Amen. <laughs> That's that little Adobe child there. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Amen. Galatians, if you will. Galatians. Verse 11, you see how large a letter, Galatians 6, verse 11, you see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand. It was a, it was a feat. It was a chore. We believe because of Paul's physical condition, he generally got someone to write for him. But he said, I have written this letter with mine own hand. And then he says in verse 12, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but, des but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision but a new creature. Now, I, of course, I love the book of Galatians. It deals with combating the legalists and but this is a result of my Bible reading revival. When I'm in Bible reading revival, I, I came across this and I got just a couple little nuggets out of Galatians 6 that I'm going to share, share with you today. It's not a, uh, not a new message. There's nothing new under the sun, Ecclesiastes says. But if you listen, I know you'll get something out of it. Um, I got to thinking too, and, I, and I, compared, I compared verse number 12 and 13 with politicians. Politicians are like verse number 12 and 13. They've been accused of being all show and no substance. In other words, they care more about looking good and maintaining the appearance um, uh, of significance than they do about actually making a difference. That's what I kind of like about our new administration up there. He really, really not trying to please a whole lot of people, is he? Hey, man, he, I mean, he's going against, uh, he's going against the grain. He sure is. Drain the swamp, kind of, you know. I think that's pretty good. But nevertheless, most of them do. They try to maintain a, um, a uh, uh, looking good, you know, looking good. No substance. All show and no substance. Uh, and and uh, a lot of people's like that. To some, image is everything. And so religion, like politics, can be approached with a style without substance mentality as well. And that's exactly what's happening right here in verse number 12 and, 13, 12 and 13. A lot of religious leaders are concerned with making people look good on the outside. Um, how many's got this new HD TV thing out, you know? Yeah, everybody, everybody now has got an HD TV. You can't even give those tube models away, you know what? We try to sell them at the helping hands and they might go for a dollar, I don't know. I mean, everybody wants that new HD. And uh, if you ever watched that new HD TV and, uh, and you can see the makeup that's caked on them people on the TV, I, I never knew they wore that kind of makeup. I got to thinking about, I got to thinking about these, uh, these, these big superstars in religion. Uh, they probably got to have it budgeted in their church now for makeup, I'd say, wouldn't you? I'm thinking about it. It's all show and no substance. All show and no substance. Instead of this, thus saith the Lord. Uh, well, and uh, their, their concern, and a lot of religious leaders in churches today are concerned with making people look good on the outside. And that's basically, you know, we use the illustration here for years. I got it from down here, but it's, it spoke to a whole lot of people. It's a, a lot of preachers are, are really trying to get people into, into, their, into their mold, into their category. It's, it's not hard, it's not hard to... Uh, when, I, when I use these, just in your mind, remember this is, um, you've seen this, this, we'll draw a big old circle and we'll call this circle A and then we'll draw another big old circle right here, right in the middle and we'll, we'll label it circle B and then we'll draw another one way over here and we'll call it circle C, circle A, B and C 
That's pretty simple, isn't it? Simple as ABC. One, two, three. Uh, do, re, mi. All right. <laughs> so we got circle A. Everybody knows what circle A is. Circle A is, is uh, I mean, you, you're lost, you're undone, you're a hellion, I don't want to be like this, I'm out in the world. And that's basically the testimonies that you hear. Well, I was out in the world and, and everything else, but now I don't do that anymore, so I must be saved. Well, the reason I don't do that anymore, they got in with some religious outfit that, that started putting a little makeup on them. You know, they started putting a little makeup on them, got them looking good, got them to quit their drinking and their smoking and their, their cursing. And isn't that sad, though, that a lot of all church people ought to quit their drinking and smoking and cursing, but you still got a lot of church people that do that. You know, all three. That's terrible, isn't it? Brings a bad, bad attitude, bad testimony on the church. But nevertheless, we get them out of circle A, and we tell them that you need to look good. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I was up on 58 Highway. If y'all are familiar with Chattanooga, you know where 58 Highway is. It's going out there toward Camp Joy. And I was working at a grocery store out there, Pruitt's Food Town on Highway 58. And I worked with them. I managed one for, I managed one of their stores for about 10 or 12 years. And um, anyway, uh, I was a um, pretty hard, pretty hard boss. And then I came in there and started doing things a little bit different. And I'll never forget what the meat market manager said, uh, Hennessy. Uh, he said, Mr. Hennessy, he said, uh, boy, he said, uh, you must something, you must have got saved. You're different. And I thought, well, I am different, aren't I? I started going to church. And I said, I so saw I must be saved. You know what happened? You know what happened to me and it happens to a whole lot of people is they, they, they realize there's something wrong here. And they don't want to be like that anymore. They're about to lose their family. They're about to lose their finances, about to lose their job, about to lose their everything they have. And so all of a sudden, they're going to get cleaned up real quick. They start going to church. They get a, they get a quick fix down at the altar or somewhere, wherever they get it. They get a quick fix. And then all of a sudden, they're in circle B. And they say, and they're, they're over here. And they say, I must be saved because I don't do this anymore. That's what they say. I don't, I'm not, so, so why are you going to heaven? Because I'm not the man I used to be. In other words, I had a good makeup artist. Got me all cleaned up, put me some makeup on, now I can get on HDTV. You see that? I can get on HDTV. And so I, a lot of people just stuck, like Gret Smallwood brought out this morning. He himself was one of them, as well as a lot of us were. We're stuck in circle B. Don't tell me that I'm not saved because I don't do the things I used to do. Well, monks and monasteries don't do what they used to do either. I mean, if you, if you isolate yourself from what you used to do, you can't get involved in it. Maybe not on the outside, but in this right here in your mind, you're still doing the same thing. So, you know, it's not that, is it? It's not cleaning up. So, all right, I'm going to park in Circle B. That's where a lot of people are today in churches. They're in Circle B. They got out of circle A, praise the Lord. Most people in church are out of circle A. They're in circle B or they wouldn't even be in church. So a lot of people are sitting in church, but there's still a void there and they don't have that peace that passes understanding and they keep wondering why in the world does this man or this lady over here say, I know that I know that I know I'm going to heaven. That's arrogance. That's arrogance. I remember people used to say that and I said, there's nobody can know that. Nobody, nobody can know for sure if they're going to be in heaven. You've got to wait to die till you find out. But as long as I'm in circle B, I'm on my way. I'm helping God get me there. So you see what's happening right here in Galatians chapter number 6, verse number 12. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer, persecu suffer persecution for the cross of Christ, for neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. Well, here's another one marked up now for the Faith Baptist Church. We got another one that's cleaned up. He don't do what he used to do, and he's, he's looking good, and he's upstanding in the community, joined the 365 Club, got him a new car, takes care of his family, works hard on his job, so he must be saved. Isn't that the way the world gauges saved people? Basically, it is, isn't it? You know, he's not what he used to be, so maybe he's saved. Well, anyway, we talk about people glorying in the flesh, and uh, by not taking a stand in the truth of the gospel concerning the cross of Christ, these people right here in verse number 12 and 13 avoided persecution. All right, now let's talk about glory in the cross. We glory in the flesh, 
And we found out people in circle B are still glory, glorying in the flesh. Glorying, is that's a good word, isn't it? It's kind of like bigly. Y'all got that new word bigly? Everybody knows where I'm coming from on that one. That's Trump's new word, bigly. We're, we're going we're gonna to do things bigly. We're at Faith Baptist Church. We're going to do things bigly. Amen. All right. But here we're talking. We're talking. We're in the Bible. We're in Galatians chapter number six. Now we talk about glorying in the cross. That's Christ alone. The Bible said in verse number 14, but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. All right. Now people, uh, we talk about here, um, when we glory in the cross, then we have to ask ourselves, uh, who gets the credit for salvation? Who gets the credit for who gets the credit for your salvation? Everyone agree that 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 we're we're basically everyone here is out of circle A. Cir circle A circle A was it was enjoyable, but it wasn't that hard to get out of because when 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 you're in circle A and 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 you experience some of the slime pits of the world. You don't want them anymore. I don't want this kind of life. I don't want to be a, I don't want to be a drunkard. I don't want to be a, a, a drug addict. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't like what's going on in my life. I don't like being a slacker. I don't, I don't like it. So it's pretty, I mean, it, it, it's, it can be a fun life when you're young. But when you get a little older and you, and you start wanting a family and things like that, it's pretty easy to get out of this circle. We, 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 we get out of it. We want to better ourselves. And so we get over here. And then we're in circle B. And then everything starts going well. Our, our employer likes us now. And uh, even my wife likes me now. And, and my kids tolerate me. And everything's a little better. You see what we're talking about here. And, and everything starts working out pretty good. All right, now, so I'm, I'm thinking that I must be saved because I'm not there anymore. All right, now the question is, is who gets the credit for your salvation right here? You do. The Bible says in Romans chapter number 10, it says, um, uh, talking about Paul's brethren after the flesh, Paul himself said, I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. If you'd like to turn over to Romans 10, you can find these words. Have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. And this is what Paul said. For they going about to establish their own righteousness... They established their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Now, d don't talk about what I'm doing because I'm not doing what I used to do. I've established my own righteousness. I'm out of circle A. I've put a list of rules on my refrigerator and I'm going by them as closely as I can. As close as I can, I'm following these rules, and I'm just not the man I used to be. My family likes me now. The community likes me. Everything likes me. You know what I've done? I have, this, and, 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 and I've established my own righteousness. I've established my own standard. And you say, well, how, how do you do that? Well, again, I've just told you. you. You start putting lists that you think you have to do to gain audience with the Holy God. And you know, included in that list could be... How do you know you're saved? Well, I made a trip to the altar. You know what you just added to your list of righteousness? You getting out of your ch chair and coming down here to the altar and, and making things right. You've added that to your list of righteousness. Yeah, amen? What's that up? Oh, yeah, forgiving, even giving. I've started giving. And I must be going to heaven. Miss, Miss Gunton held up a tithing envelope because I give. Well, I mean, you got you got uh, the liberal crowd gives to causes. They give to abortion clinics. I mean, they're giving, aren't they? But um, now I know we're going to switch it back on this on the coin, the right side of the coin. A lot of people are giving to the things of the Lord and thinking that's going to help them get into heaven. So they've established their own righteousness. All right. Now, here it is. Whatever, whatever, whatever flag you fly. In your defense is your righteousness. Y'all get this? Whatever flag you want to fly today is your righteousness. Why are you going to heaven? If your answer is because I have done something, I've went to church, or I'm a good boy, or I'm a good girl, 
uh, I'm, a, I'm a decent husband or a decent wife. That's your righteousness. Now, I want to know who gets the credit. You get the credit. So Paul said, if I'm going to glory in the cross, then that means at some point in Paul's life that he got out of circle B and he stepped over here in circle C. Yeah. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. All right, go to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. We're talking about glorying in the cross. Just turn over a couple of pages there to Philippians. Philippians chapter 3. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 3, in verse 4, Paul, the Apostle Paul speaking, he said, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath where he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. And then he begins to give his credentials. He said, Do you think you're going to heaven by the law? He said, Look, you're looking at the man that's done everything right. He said, I was circumcised the, the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews is touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness." You see, Paul, Paul gave up his, uh, his own standards. He got out of circle B and got into circle C. Cir and that's just in my mind. You see, circle A, I'm not in circle A. Thank God I'm not there anymore. But I was real content in circle B for a long time because I just didn't do the things I used to do. I'm, getting, I'm a better man. But better men aren't going to heaven. Better women aren't going to heaven. Only saved men and saved women is going to heaven. You see that? And the Bible said, uh, And be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God. How? By faith. So people that accuse preachers and accuse us here at the Faith Baptist Church of not preaching on repentance, we just got through preaching on it. Repentance is, it's, it's, a, it's a word, it's metanoia. It means to change your mind. And the hardest people in the world to deal with are those people in circle B because they think that they've already got a hold of something. I don't care what denomination you came from or where, how you were raised, there was a lot of people in circle B all over this land in denominations, each and every denomination, in Baptists and every other denomination that think that they're, they're content with what they have. But then when preaching like this comes, they're a little bit uneasy about their, their own salvation. And, they, and, they, and they'll, they'll run out the door. Well, I won't run, but they'll go out the door. And as soon as they get off, then that conviction from the scriptures, of course, the doctrine preached, it'll begin to wear off and they'll get a little comfortable until they come back again next Sunday, if they come back at all next Sunday. What I'm trying to tell you to do is um, get out of circle B and rest in the finished work of Christ. Amen. Um, no man, no man, no mere man has ever, ever been perfect or maintained perfection except our holy, spotless, wonderful Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So thank God Paul got into circle C. Now, Christianity isn't about our achievements. It's not about what we can do for God. It's about what God 
has done for us. Look at Ephesians, if you will. It's what God has done for us. I'm not going to keep you long. Ephesians chapter 1. Christianity is not about our achievement, achievements, but it's about what God has done for us. And when we finally come to the realization that Christ Jesus is salvation and He paid it all, it takes you out of the equation of any kind of plan. Any kind of plan. And when you're out of that, that equation, when you're out of that plan, then you can never glory in yourself that you'll have to glory in Christ. Because you finally realize that He paid it all on the cross of Calvary and shed His blood and rose again the third day. So salvation will always, always, it will humiliate man and it will always exalt God. It always will when you get a hold of it. I promise you it will. Now if you'll notice in Ephesians, again, Christianity is not about our achievements. It's not about what we can do for God. It's about what God has done for us. The Bible says in verse 3 of Ephesians 1, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. Now, again, we're taking ourselves out of the equation as we're reading Ephesians chapter number 1, and we find that we were chosen by the Father. You, did, you were chosen by the Father. Now, I'm not, a, I'm not a Calvinist. I'm not a Calvinist, so I'm going to explain what I'm talking about. We're chosen by the Father. Hold your place there in the book of Ephesians and go to uh, Romans, chapter, Romans chapter 3 is where I think I want to go. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. All right, the Bible says this. Now, in verse 21, is everyone in Romans 3? Again, you're out of the equation when it comes to a plan of God. Romans chapter number 3 lets us know what the Bible means when it says we're chosen by God. The Bible says, but now, verse 21, the righteousness of God without the law is manifest manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So even the law that God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai, witnesses of the Savior, the prophets, witness of the Savior. And the Bible goes on to say in verse 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. And what does it say there? What's the next two words? Unto all. There's no mistake in the Word of God. Every word is perfect. Every word is preserved. It's all in order. It's unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. So salvation is unto the world. The whole world has been chosen to accept Christ. That does not mean they're going to accept Christ, but they're chosen to. They're chosen to. It's unto all and upon all. Let me give you, some, let me give you another verse or two to back that up. So there won't be any, any kind of doubt whatsoever. The Bible says over in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. If you're not turning, at least write these verses down. And so when I read Ephesians chapter number 1 and tell you that you're in verse 4, that you're chosen by the Father, that simply means that the, you're, the whole world is chosen. The Calvinists teach that this side is chosen to go to heaven and this side's chosen to go to hell. Where they get that damnable doctrine, it's not from this book. Amen? And it's a very damnable doctrine. They're so close to other things, and then they bring out that doctrine of predestination. It's damnable doctrine. And then uh, we look at 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10. The Bible says this, For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of who? If you don't read this verse, and by the way, the Holy Spirit put this next phrase in there so there wouldn't be any controversy either. He is the Savior of all men, but then it goes on to say, especially of those that believe. See, He is the Savior. Before you ever believed, He was your Savior. He was your Savior. What does a Savior do? Saves. He delivers. When did Christ redeem or purchase the world? 
at Calvary. He did it one time with his blood. He's not going to come back down and do it again. He's not going to come down and do it again when you come to the altar and ask him to do it either. He's not going to. He's already done it. He's already done it. Just why don't you believe it? That's it. So we see he's the savior of all men, uh, especially to those that believe. And so there, that's, that's a good verse. And then um, there's a lot more verses. There's one over in 1 John chapter number 2. Uh, verse number 1 said, Jesus Christ, uh, uh, my little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, he has an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And then verse 2 says of 1 John 2, Jesus, he is the propitiation. That word propitiation Sounds like a big word, but it simply means satisfactory sacrifice. Jesus is a propitiation for our sin and not for ours. Ours being who? Being Christians. Ours. That's who John, my little children. So we see the context. He's a propitiation for our sin, Christian sin, but not for ours only, also for the sins of who? For the whole world. So he was a propitiation for your sin 2,000 years ago. Your sin has been paid for by the blood of Christ. Can y'all, I hope you see that. The Bible says over here in the book of 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies. Listen to this even denying the Lord that bought them. These lost people denying the Lord that bought, when did Christ buy them? At Calvary. But they never accepted Christ as their Savior. So, so we're not preaching strange doctrine. Your sins have been paid for already on the cross of Calvary. We don't ask God to do something with our sins. We praise Him for what He has done with our sins. Amen. And then so He chose us according to Ephesians chapter number 1 and verse number 4. God chose us. And then look at verse 7 of Ephesians chapter 1. The Bible said, In whom we have redemption. We had just talked about it. We have redemption. That's, redemption means to purchase, to buy back. In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. So we've been purchased. Our sins have been paid for and the human race have been, has been forgiven because of Christ. So what am I to do with that? I'm to receive it. Is this difficult? I don't beg for it. I simply receive it. It's, it's, it's already been paid. Forgiveness has been granted. Receive it. Re receive it. So if God chose us, then the Bible says there in verse 7, the Son, God the Son, saves us. And then the good part, He doesn't leave it just like that. He seals us too. The, whole, the Spirit of God seals us. You know this outline. Look at Ephesians 1.13. In whom we all, ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So the Father chose us, the Son saves us, and the Spirit seals us. So we see God working in our salvation made a covenant with Himself. Because he could swear by none greater, he swore by himself, and that leaves you out of the picture. So when you hear the gospel, you have but one option. That's to receive it, to believe it, you see. So that's synonymous. Receiving is believing. Believing is receiving. That's faith, amen. And the Bible says that the Spirit of God that seals you in Ephesians 1.14 is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. Now, uh, we have been redeemed. We are sealed. But God said we're not going to stop there. Redemption not only means to seal your soul, keep your soul out of hell, but redemption, He's going to redeem this mess that we're living in. That we have to put all the makeup on. Amen. He's going to give us a new one one day. He's going to redeem our body. So that the, the Spirit of God in me is the inherit the, the, the earnest of our inheritance. 
the earnest people use that illustration about buying a house and but I don't want to carry that too far because I know some people's bought a house without earnest money but um, still though the principles there when we buy a house what do we put down earnest money earnest money tells the buyers that we're going to go through with the deal if we don't go through now we're, we put it down because we know that if we don't go through with the deal they're going to keep our money See, so the earnest of the earnest of God, the Holy Spirit, is a lot more than just putting money down on a house. It's God's seal. It's God's divine promise. Amen. That He's going to redeem the body. All right, back to Ephesians and back to Galatians 6 as we close. All right, so there's a show in the flesh. There's a there's a there's a show in the cross, a glory in the cross. Verse 12 and 13 is circle B. Uh, verse 14, Paul said he got out of circle B and got in circle C. And he said, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. All right, the cross tells the depths of human sin. We're just reviewing. The cross tells the depths of human sin. Henry Ironside, H.A. Ironside, said this. said, The cross, it's the measure of of man's hatred toward God. Just multiply your sin by the population of the world. How many people's in the world? Seven billion or more? Multiply just your sin by the population of the world. You see, the <coughs> Ironside was right when he said the cross is a measure of man's hatred toward God. The cross not only it is a measure of man's hatred, but the cross tells the height of God's love. Sin is the second biggest thing in the world. The only thing that's bigger is the love of God. It's rich and pure and measureless and strong. Amen. The Bible said in Romans 5, 8, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. Died. Christ died for me. I, I wish you could have been with me when that truth hit me. When that truth hit me that Christ died for David Rowan. I've never been the same. I, and, and if you'll get a hold of that, you'll never be the same. Your family will never be the same. Your husband, your wife, your children will never be the same. I am going to heaven. I finally got out of circle B and got into circle C. You know what the cross also tells? Not only the depths of sin, but the height of God's love. The cross tells of God reaching out. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest, Matthew 11. And then if you go to Matthew chapter number 28, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. We're to take this same message that you heard today to the uttermost parts of the world. And you know what the privilege that God has given us is? Is that He's included us in doing that. In doing that. Salvation's all of God, but propagating it, He's, he's, he's going to let us share in that. So let's get out and tell people about Christ. Amen? All right, let's stand to our feet. Amen. Piano player, if you'll come, Brother Kirk, you'll get us a song. Let's stand to our feet. Gracious Heavenly Father, you're so good to us. We thank you for loving us, dying for us. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done, already done on Calvary. I pray that decisions would be made today. Today, Lord, I pray that, that hearts came in open, minds came in open, and received the a blessing. Lord, people still struggling with this idea of, of going to heaven. And not sure. I pray that they'll get that settled today. And we'll thank you for what you do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we